So um, let's talk about uh, genomic markers. Um, and then, again, most of it I think about, about DNA sequencing because I think that'll be something more new. Um, obviously, we're quite interested in this at the University of Washington, and uh, many of you are involved in it. So I always put this up as somewhat provocative, and some of you have seen this before. I put this up. I say, this is the challenge. I mean, this is breast cancer. Okay, well, why are we talking about breast cancer here um, in a urology meeting? Well, because they clearly have markers. They have uh, ERP or positive, they have HER2. And they have this 21 gene assay. There's no doubt that they've used these for years. We don't have the luxury of that in certainly prostate cancer. And then more recently, many of you were at ASCO and heard the Taylor RX findings that the NCI put out this a big press release. It actually works. There's no doubt that it might uh, save therapy in as much, uh, as much as 70% in this thing might, might not need chemotherapy. We're behind the game. I mean, there's no doubt prostate cancer is behind the game. If you look at the NCCN guidelines for prostate cancer, it's embarrassing that there's nothing there yet. We have to get to the point of putting th biomarkers on the guidelines and how can we do that? And hopefully we'll have some things here. So they have all these, these. There are many biomarker questions. We won't go through these for sakes of time, but I think it's important for you to know. Whenever we look at a biomarker, of course, what's the rationale? Is there application and validation? Perhaps the most important question is this one, the middle one, which is, does it really add to what we already know? I mean, for localized prostate cancer, we already know PSA, Gleason, stage, number of cores, age, race, family history. We know many things that are significant in models, even BMI for some models. Do biomarkers really add to that or not? And have they really been tested in that way? I would say no uh, for many of these markers. And then the last one, which really is the end, of the end of the day, does it really change what we do? Does it impact choice of therapy? And then does it really improve uh, the life of our prostate cancer patients? So we'll kind of run through these. Um, this is my, another version of what Jerry showed. Um, and it's a partial list. I mean, you have to update this every few months. And of course, some of the, some of the markers are in both for the f first biopsy and the second biopsy. Uh, some are involved in pretreatment decisions and some are involved in post-treatment. And then this is really, I think, the burgeoning field uh, biomarkers, which is an advanced disease, and I can't cover all of this for sakes of time. I know that there are those that are interested in AR variants. I think we might hear a talk about that at the break, um, but I'll talk mostly about DNA sequencing and a little bit about, about circulating tumor cells. So um, those are the sort of disease state ones. Jerry, I know didn't have time. I'll highlight two biomarkers that are used in the pre-diagnostic setting, not necessarily for the markers themselves, but I think the concept. So the concept of these two, this is a urinary marker. This is called Select uh, MDX. It's not available in the U.S. It's in Europe. Um, and the point of this is that it was a fairly big, big study. Um, and the, the point of this is that the MPV. And I think that Jerry said you can talk about MRI, MPV. I always tell my trainees, you know, MPV is king. I mean, you, you, want, you want something that says a high negative predictive value for not having something significant, and in this case, high-grade prostate cancer. I think we can't get a PPV over 50, 60 percent usually, but an MPV of 90-something percent, that's pretty good. The other marker, which is confirmed MDX, and again, this again, high-grade disease, if you could look at degree of methylation, again, you look at MPV of 96 percent, that's a really high bar, okay? And so I think that that's, what, that that's the bar that we have to get over for all biomarkers is a very high NPV, not necessarily sensitivity, specificity, but something more long performance measures. This is the only slide that I have all these markers on uh, intentionally because I think, again, you've probably all discussed these in past years. We can go through them in the, in the discussion period if you'd like. Um, they are all uh, commercially available. They, many of us use these markers. There's prolayers. It's a cell cycle one with endpoints of mortality, risk stratification. There's also an active surveillance threshold. The oncotype uh, uh, test is, is a multi-gene pathway. Their primary endpoint is adverse pathology, but they have other, other endpoints as well. And then the, the other big one of the, the top three is the cipher, and it's kind of a whole genome, uh, RNA-seq. Um, their endpoints are metastasis-free survival, and interestingly, they, are, they look like they're a predictive biomarker, not just prognostic, but predictive for those who might respond to radiation therapy. Again, I, and I know you've heard these in past meetings, and I think that we'll leave it here. Happy to talk about it. During the, during the QA and the discussion, if you'd like. The last thing on those markers, this is probably what really has to happen more. This is a trial. It's a phase two trial. It's an NRG trial. And it is taking men who, need, who might need salvage radiation therapy, and, they, and this is from Felix Feng and Dan Spratt, and they take men that are actually higher grade, they have persistent or persistent PSA elevation or pathologic PT3 disease that have biochemical recurrence. 
And interestingly, they're stratifying by this molecular genotype. So this is one of the first trials that's out there that will actually stratify by a biomarker to either receive uh, radiation therapy with a placebo or radiation therapy plus an advanced antigen blocker. So I think this will be a very interesting trial. I know there's, a, um, there's another trial that's being put forth by Alicia Morgans through the... Through, um, uh, I forget which which uh, which cooperative group. That's also going to be yeah. That's also going to use a biomarker to stratify actually who gets in the trial. So I think those trials need to be done. That's a phase three trial or it's like phase two three trial that is going through uh, right now approval process. That has to happen. Once we understand this, then I think it will uh, uh, lend to the next stage. So I'm going to spend the last three or four minutes talking about I think the future, which is the emerging model of what I think cancer treatment will be. I have to recognize Colin Pritchard and Heather Chang at our institute for giving me some of these slides, because I think we're going to look at germline. This is uh, blood. Uh, this is DNA. This is going to be tissue. And we're going to take this. We're going to look at the actual mutations, which I'll run through how we do that. And then we're going to really base our therapy on this. And we're already doing this. I know that Lenny will get into this a little bit, I'm sure, of who to do this on, so I don't have that. Uh, but again, this is sort of Achilles' heel, if you, if you know that. So target, target a specific pathway, and then we can really, uh, again, affect change for our patients. So how do we do this? It's next-generation sequencing. Uh, traditionally, I'd say for the last decade or so, we've been doing sort of hot spot panels. So if you can see, yeah, you can. From the back of the room, those little dots are little genes. I mean, one, one gene at a time. Uh, pretty uh, uh, low uh, volume genes, partial gene sequencing. Well, we're gonna, we've really actually leveled the playing field. And we're looking at all genes now. These are hundreds of thousands of genes. We were looking at all of them in, in really whole genome sequencing. So we understand everything about them. So it's basically full capture. And these are some of the ones that have been put out. And we won't go through all of these. And these are several papers in Nature and in Cell and otherwise looking at various gene amplifications or mutations. And they have really big relevance in what we do. So if you have someone with sort of aurora kinase or MYC, it's a neuroendocrine phenotype or others. And what we've done from this stage, and many have done this, and this is published a few years ago, but I think it's relevant, for, again, for biomarkers, is that we clearly know that there are different grades of prostate cancer, but there are probably different genomic classifications. So where they have aurora kinase, where they're spink overexpressed, SPOP mutated, and then again, after various treatments, they can have a different phenotype as well. So treatments can cause the, uh, basically selective pressure, which we all know, that uh, develop other types of phenotypes. We've done this, and this is from Colin Pritchard. Again, you can't, we're not going to run through all these, but there are about 50 at the top that are, we think are currently actionable. So if we know that there is, there is a, a, a BRAF mutation, they, we, we might be able to do something about that therapeutically. Um, just some sample issues. I think it was a very fascinating talk yesterday about using fresh tissue in, in a bladder sort of organoid model. We love fresh tissue, but fresh tissue is hard to get. Expensive to get, hard to get, but it has the best in terms of tumor quality. I have very few false negatives. What's the easiest? Well, circling tumor DNA. The, the easiest to get, but probably the poorest quality tissue and we have, uh, poorest quality source, and we really have to overcome that hurdle. We also know that, and this is Colin's work, this is a New England Journal of Medicine article, that of men with metastatic prostate cancer, about 12% actually have a, have a, a germline uh, a mutation in DNA repair. That's higher than we thought. It might actually be even a little higher than that. And these are actual mutations, and this was part of the ARS that I want to talk to you about. But the landscape has greatly changed. We look at tumor tissue. We can understand where they have a, a, a mutation in the Wnt pathway, a PI3 kinase pathway, AR pathway we know. The big one, I think, is DNA repair, and then maybe even cell cycle. What does it really mean if they have these? Well, they're really sensitive to platinum. If it's DNA uh, damage, they might be I.O. Medi mediated if they have a mismatch repair, like a DNA, uh, mismatch DNA repair mechanism like, like MSH2. And we do see that in about one out of every 20 patients. So it's not a, an overly rare, rare occurrence. This is a paper by Heather Chang, and again, this was published in European Urology. I think this really shows it very easily. This is a patient who blew right through Abby Enza Gosataxel, um, found to have a BRCA2 mutation, gave carbo. And you can see an a, amazing regression. And then, uh, and then again, uh, off any therapy, regrowth, again, re-challenged with carbo and had a dramatic response. Same patient down here went through Abby and Zid, docetaxel, gave carboplatin with a dramatic response. So there's no doubt that these mutations actually are actionable in our patients. And this just shows all these trials. And again, many of you, uh, certainly attendees in the audience, 
can see your trial up here that, 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 are, that are being run now. Phase two, three trials um, that usually are for, for DNA repair defects, and then they're giving uh, either PARP inhibitor or otherwise. This is, I'll just show the two, the last two slides are the two phase three trials that are undergoing. This is Triton three, metastatic CRPC. They have to have a mutation in BRCA. They have to have failed one prior next-gen antiandrogen. Um, and then they're, they're randomized to recapra versus the next uh, in, in the pathway, the NCCN guidelines, enzalutamide, ABI, or docetaxel, and then it's RPFS endpoint. The other phase three is called profound. Again, has to have a somatic mutation in HRD, have to have failed either ABI or ENZA, and then they get uh, randomized to laparib versus the other one, and there's a potential uh, a crossover. Again, RPFS design. So that's, I think the future is, is in sequencing both germline as well as tumor sequencing. Uh, there's a lot of novel emerging biomarkers across that whole spectrum, you know, pre-diagnostic, diagnostic, and then advanced. Um, the precision targets, we, we know at least some of them. Uh, and I think we're really learning more about them. They can be actionable, so change in therapy, and they have implications for relatives. So we have a family genetics clinic where um, men uh, that have a BRCA mutation have their family members tested and, and go down a cascade of testing uh, relatives. There are multiple methodological issues which I couldn't get into. Um, we all know about, about those issues, and then we really are looking for um, the clinical trials to answer these questions in, in our prostate cancer patients.